Well, that got pretty intense, and it continued during the commercial break. We know that because someone at CNN leaked a transcript of Miller's post-interview remarks. They were apparently on tape. It was all done in an effort to embarrass him, apparently. Stephen Miller joins us tonight. Stephen Miller, thanks a lot for coming on. Hey, thank you for having so me. So CNN uh, called around to news organizations today and said that you were escorted off the set by security. Presumably, you were not a physical threat. You were not armed. My question is, they, but they felt you were a threat. Do you think if you had been, I don't know, a member of MS-13 here illegally, that CNN would have had security pull you off the set? Well, I assume if I was a member of MS-13 here illegally, they would be clamoring to get me into the voting booth. But I think that, <laughs> I think that, um, that like many things CNN says, uh, <laughs> like this story has the most uh, important virtue of all CNN stories of being not true. Well, here's what we know is true, and here's <laughs> an amusing what story, was but striking not a true one. to me about the whole thing. So there was a video apparently taken, without your knowledge, of you on the set after the segment ended, during the commercial break, and someone, I, apparently from CNN, I don't know who else would have access to it, leaked that to other news organizations. Think of that. Well, it's just another example of CNN's very low <laughs> journalistic standards. But uh, I was glad to have people hear what I said on camera and off camera, which is that CNN has been extraordinarily biased, extraordinarily unfair to the president, and is not giving their information, uh, their viewers, honest information. So you wanted to talk about immigration, um, and the DACA debate is obviously the focus of a lot of energy in the Congress right now. Um, the, the priorities for the administration, you have said, are ending chain migration, financing a border wall, and ending the diversity lottery. Of those three, what would you say is the most important priority from your point of view? Well, look, we need them all because the reality is, is that anything you do on DACA is going to have some predictable consequences, right? You're going to have a, an increase in new illegal immigration, so you need to have a wall, you need to close the enforcement loopholes. Um, and then you're also going to have an increase in the overall number of people coming into the country, and that's why you have to deal with chain migration, you have to deal with the visa lottery. And these are crucial reforms to make the system work for Americans. You know, Donald Trump has a very radical idea, and that's that when we make changes to our immigration laws, the group we should be most concerned about are everyday, hardworking Americans, the citizens who make this country run, who obey the laws, follow the rules, pay their taxes, show up and vote, the people who are loyal to this country. And Donald Trump is saying our country should be loyal to them in return. So, so Democrats argue back that ending chain migration and ending the diversity lottery would prevent a lot of people, decent people, from coming to this country. What's their argument against financing a border wall? What, well, why do you think they oppose that? Well, as you know, I mean, they all voted for a uh, border barrier, a hard physical border barrier. Back in 2006, the Secure Fence Act, Joe Biden voted for it, Barack Obama voted for it, Hillary Clinton voted for it, et cetera. Uh, so that's um, it's just a new position they apparently have that they're opposed to any but what, form of what border security. But what animates it? Like, what, why is that? an absolute sticking point for Democrats. A bunch of them have said, including in leadership, we're not supporting anything that includes financial. Why? What's well, their look, objection look, to if that? If Democrats oppose a border wall, they're just saying they want continued unending illegal immigration. But let me deal with the other question, too. Uh, you talked about, they say, well, you know, if you have chain migration, it could keep good people out. There's 7 billion people in the world. Most of them are good, hardworking, decent, honest, principled people. But the reality is there's a limit to how many people any country can bring in. And we as a country have a right to say we want to bring people in based on their ability to contribute to our economy, to be safe, productive citizens, and to uplift the nation as a whole. You, know, you think about our current system of chain migration, Tucker. So over the last 10 years, we've admitted about 10 million people through our chain migration system. To understand how many people that is, you're talking about every hour, that's about the size of a high school auditorium. Every day, it's the size of a large high school. Every week, a small city. Every month, a medium to average sized city. And every year, a very large city, a city the size of Washington, D.C., or almost to San Francisco, every single year, just through chain migration. What's the effect of that on taxpayers? What's the effect of that on wage earners? What's the effect of and that? And that's, that's legal. Right. That's just folks coming in on green cards through chain migration. So what's the right? I always ask this question of proponents of immigration, including of illegal immigration, what's the ideal number of immigrants, people from other countries moving here every year? Right, and oftentimes they won't have an answer to that question. Well, what's, what's your answer? The, um, I mean, I have, I have my own views on it, but I think the important point is, is that ending chain migration, as the president has called for, is necessary not just for economic security, but for national security. You saw the recent attempted uh, terrorist attack in New York, the individual who came here, the, uh, was brought through the chain migration system, right? They came through a, a nephew, 
green card. Right. And that's just not a smart way for a country to run its immigration system. So what should be the criteria for entry in the United States? Well, you know, Donald Trump supported the RAISE Act, and it looked at things like, what's your proficiency in the language? What what economic skills do you have? Do you have a background in in sciences? Do you have a background in engineering? Do you have a background in in, in law or or, or writing? Uh, It looked at things like your age. Obviously, you bring in immigrants who are in their 80s or 90s, that's going to have a significant expense on society. So you want folks primarily in their in their working years. But what about, I mean, we interviewed someone last week who said, well, who will pick the strawberries? I mean, how how many immigrants, low wage, low skilled immigrants do we need a year for the ag sector? Well, as you as you as you know, um, only about one percent of the immigrant uh, uh, population of the country works in agriculture, so it's discussed a lot, but it's a very small portion of the overall labor force. The, you know, the typical job that a lower skilled immigrant worker might do might be uh, construction work, it might be hospitality work, it might be restaurant work, going onto the welfare system if there isn't uh, a job for that individual. So if there's no clear economic rationale for our current immigration system, and it doesn't sound like there is one, there's no economist saying we need to bring in this number of low skilled immigrants, then why does the Democratic Party support our current system and want to liberalize our current system so vehemently? What, what motivates them? Well, you're asking the right question. But I think in the context of this debate, the question that the president is putting before the American people is when we have an immigration system, whose needs are we fundamentally trying to serve? The needs of special interests, uh, the needs of politicians, the needs of foreign countries and foreign nationals and the needs of our own country and our own workers. And so at the end of the day, our hope for a bipartisan deal is that you could have enough Democrats say that listening to the voters and the voice of the American people, we want a system that serves American workers first. And what Donald Trump has done that's so exceptional is for the first time that I can remember, for the first time you can probably remember, we have a president of this country who when he talks about immigration, he, took, he talks about what is right for the everyday, hardworking person. So what what can, we're almost out of time, so I just want to get to the one quick political question, which is Democrats have said they're not going to come to any deal with these three components in it, border wall, reducing chain migration, ending diversity lottery. Where's the wiggle room on on the White House side? Look, Democrats ultimately have to make a choice. They care a lot about providing a benefit to illegal immigrants. We're saying to them, if you want to make that deal, then you have to deliver benefits for American families and American taxpayers, too. And if both sides are willing to agree to those terms, Tucker, then we can have a deal. And most importantly, we can have an immigration system that 10, 20, 30, 50 years from now produces more assimilation, higher wages, more economic opportunity, and better prospects for immigrants and U.S. born alike. Stephen Miller, thank you. Hey, thank you. Well, negotiations over...